All right, we are live again for another philosophy pop-up session. Uh, this is the second one in November. We do one on YouTube Live and one on Facebook Live for different people in, in different places. Um, we don't have anyone on yet, so I'm actually going to give it a minute or so before I get started and uh, post a, a few things here and there. Um, <clears throat> So we've already got two people now uh, chiming in. Uh, we'll give it a, a, just a few more minutes, and I'll talk a bit uh, by, by way of preface about the, the topic that, that I'm going to start with. Um, so this month we had our, our free webinar and our intensive online seminars focused on Friedrich Nietzsche, and I also did a talk here locally in the Milwaukee area on the uh, you know, sort of placing Nietzsche in, in his historical perspective, um, talking about the problem of nihilism, which, which Nietzsche saw as really the problem that we would be facing in the 20th and 21st century, and how his philosophy was supposed to explain how we got there and then be sort of, a, a in his view, kind of a remedy for that. And I think that um, that fits in very well with the theme of his first work, The Birth of Tragedy, although he doesn't use the word nihilism there, a uh, word that he'll use quite frequently in his, his later works. I should mention as well that I also did um, a session with the Pan PanSciCast podcast, um, along with uh, Mark from the Partially Examined Life, uh, specifically on Nietzsche, where uh, you know we talked quite a bit about different aspects of Nietzsche, a bit of controversy, uh, in, in the discussion as well, and that should be airing, I think they said, um, at the end of December. So it's going to be a little while before that one comes out. Um, let me quickly post uh, the live link in a few places. Um, and so, yeah, in the, in the meantime, while I'm doing that, <clears throat> I'll just tell you, uh, you know, I, I've been teaching Nietzsche for a long time, um, and I, I think The Birth of Tragedy is a very interesting work. Nietzsche kind of downplayed it a bit. Um, I think that it, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on there. But I also find a lot of people getting mixed up and, and mistaken about it. Um, There we go. So I wanted to, you know, focus on on that, um, and uh, talk about these three noble responses. Uh, the first noble response is uh, um, the Dionysiac response. The second is the Apollonian, and the third is what Nietzsche calls the Socratic. So any attempt to try to view just a, a simple dualism there is um, Kind of a, a mistake, but I, I do wind up seeing quite a few, mostly artistic uh, folks, trying to interpret the birth of tragedy along those lines. All right, just got to post it in two more places, and then we will get started in earnest. There we go. And you know me, I'm all about reaching out in social media. Um, all right. Now, if anybody hasn't joined in by this time, that is on them. <laughs> so let's talk about, about these uh, three noble responses. And so I, I mentioned that, you know, in The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche is – you know, very early on talking about the, what he calls the problem of, of life. And what he means by that is, you know, the realization that, that from the perspective that he's uh, enunciating and what he thinks a lot of, you know, smart people have, have seen over the years, uh, going all the way back into prehistory, is that life, if it does have a meaning, it's not a simple one. And it's one that we often seem to somehow miss. We tie ourselves in with, with uh, things or projects or movements, uh, ways of life that, that seem to be satisfying, seem to make sense, and then find out that, that that's not really the case. And, and Nietzsche actually uses the word nausea uh, 
to talk about the affective experience of this. And he thinks that the, you know, the, these responses to the problem of life are, you know, things that we can diagnose across cultures. So there, you might say, ways of, of responding to this, this issue, to this uh, global uh, problem that we're going to find recurring in culture after culture. What's really interesting about the birth of tragedy is that, you know, the, the two responses that he begins talking about at the, at the start, the Dionysiac response, which is oriented towards like the dynamism of life, it's de-differentiating, you might say, um, it, it, it ends up, you know, tying us into this primal unity, which is not at the same time a really happy one, but is certainly an ecstatic one. Um, there's that, and then the Apollonian represents order. Uh, it sets down limits. It, it says, you know, you won't go any further than this. And he talks about it as like a, you know, standing in, in the waves of the Dionysian and, and limiting it. Um, he doesn't use the metaphor of a seawall, but I think that would be really appropriate there. In you know um, other places, the Dionysiac exists, but it doesn't really reach its full potential the way it did in Greece. Because when it's just this dynamism, this this you know uh, primal uh, wearing things away, overcoming obstacles, uh, like I said, you know taking individuals and de-differentiating them, placing them back into this primal whole. Um, it winds up, you might say, lapsing into a kind of not full meaningfulness, right? It it uh, it may accomplish that, it, and you know, he looks at um, you know certain cultures, and he may be off base in this. He thinks that, that Indian culture, you know, in stressing the primal unity of, of things, if we think about Indian philosophy, was capturing something of the Dionysiac, um, but it, it got kind of. Um, you know, frozen in a way, um, it, it, it became less active. Um, the barbarians, uh, he, he mentions, you know, the Phrygians, and also he talks about the Germans in the Middle Ages, and uh, the Babylonians, they would have these Dionysiac rites, and they would be, you know, getting really um, into them and, and engaging in all sorts of cruelty. Um, Nietzsche says that that sort of thing doesn't really accomplish much. It might feel really great at the time, um, and it might get, you know, your, your energies out and, 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 you know, maybe adjust you back to society in a certain way, but it doesn't really, you know, produce a lasting effect. The Apollonian um, is, is what allows the Dionysiac in Greece to really become its, you know, what, what it's at least, I don't want to say it's full potential, but at least a good portion of what its potential is. And he thinks that this happens the most in Greek tragedy, in early Greek tragedy with Aeschylus and Sophocles. And the Apollonian, you might think of it as, as static, as, as, you know, order imposing itself, but it's, it, it's really dynamic in its own way. And Nietzsche contrasts, you know, the Greek Apollonian, which is in, in this dynamic tension with the Dionysiac, against what he calls a, an Egyptian rigidity, right, uh, that he associates with, with uh, Egyptian artwork, um, or with the Roman, you know, secularization, the focus on the political to the, the you might say, the detriment of everything else. Um, those, are, those are other ways of being Apollonian that Nietzsche says um, are not as productive as, as what the Greeks did. And so the Greeks, you know, if, if we think about what tragedy really meant for them, or at least, you know, for the Athenians, because it's largely taking place there in Athens, um, this, this composite is able to bring both of these together. And he thinks that you have like a Dionysiac emphasis on the chorus, on, on talking about this primal unity of, of, of being, and then you have the Apollonian level of the individuals, of the beautiful images, uh, and they're somehow able to come together in, in this dynamic tension and give us, you might say, the best of both worlds at the same time, so that something was taking place in early Greek tragedy that would later, in effect, get lost. Um,
And the reason why it gets lost is because of what Nietzsche calls the third noble response to life, which is what he at that time calls the Socratic. The other terms that he uses for this are the um, the, uh, the the Alexandrian, you know, referring to Hellenistic culture after um, the time of, of uh, the unifying of Greece under Philip and and the, the you know the creation of the uh, you might call it cosmopolitan economy, the oikonomike under under Alexander, where Greek culture is spreading throughout the Middle East. Um, but it's it's becoming a kind of standardized culture in certain respects, no longer tied with a particularly particular city state. It's also identified with Alexandria itself, where all of this literary and scientific activity was going on. And then Nietzsche will talk about scientific culture. Um, you know, from really what's going on from the, the Renaissance on in, in modern Europe and then eventually the world. And the Socratic response is, you know, it, it's not the same thing as the Apollonian. I think a lot of readers get mistaken uh, ideas about what's going on if they view the Socratic as merely like the Apollonian taken to a higher power or something like that. Because what Nietzsche stresses about the Socratic response and this is why it ends up destroying Greek tragedy in the narrative that he's telling us, is that um, it uh, winds up um, being unduly optimistic and rationalistic. It thinks that the world is, in fact, reasonable uh, in a way that, that maybe the world is, maybe the world isn't. But to say that it is, it, it represents a kind of leap of faith. And Socrates not only thinks that the world is rational, but that the human being is fundamentally rational. You know, the reason why we do stupid things, uh, bad things is, is ignorance. You know, virtue amounts to wisdom. And if we can just, you know, sort of get ourselves on track properly, we're going to, you know, change the world. Uh, Nietzsche talks about this response as not just being a response that figures out how the human being can, can make it in relation to this screwed up world that we live in, but a response that thinks, thinks that we can correct the world, that we can make it better, that in this case we'll make an exception and it'll be different for us. And, you know, so Socrates has a, a wingman, you might say, in this story, and that wingman is Euripides, the other playwright who, um, according to Nietzsche, tries to take the Dionysiac element out of Greek tragedy, and in the result also loses the Apollonian and substitutes something else in its place, something Socratic, and then just some artistic effects that, that you know, uh, you know, in, he says in, in place of the Apollonian, you have, you know, dialogue that is essentially philosophizing on the stage. Um, people account, you know, giving accounts of what they're doing. Nietzsche views this as as leading to the death of old tragedy and the rise of you know Euripides and Agathon and, and tragedy after that. He also thinks something similar happened in terms of old comedy and its transition to new comedy, which in, in his view is is equally um, superficial. It can't satisfy the fundamental deep demands that Greek tragedy was in his view, uh, satisfying for the Greeks. And, you know, looking ahead, he, he views our own age as one that's thoroughly dominated by the Socratic spirit, but it's reached a kind of twilight. It's, it, the Socratic spirit has run itself out. It's on the face optimistic, but its optimism has been kind of worn down. It realizes its own limitations. And now the question is, well, what will, what will this open the path to? Remember that these are not the only possible responses to the problem of life, according to Nietzsche. These are the three noble responses. There are plenty of other responses as well. You know, the, the person who, like, lapses into consumerism, um, I, I don't think that Nietzsche, looking at that, would say that that is Apollonian or Dionysiac or Socratic. It's something different. Um, so Nietzsche is not saying these three cover every person or every possible culture or configuration. Um, but what he's looking towards and what he hopes is going to happen through German music, because at the time that he's writing that, he's kind of hitched his wagon to, to Wagner's star, is that 
um, German music and German philosophy will allow a sort of reuniting of the, the Apollonian and Dionysian, not in the exactly the same way as happened in Greek tragedy, but in a new configuration. And so, um, you know, to sort of bring this to a close, if we were to adopt Nietzsche's perspective, which he, he says was overly optimistic about something like a national renewal, if we were to try to think about how this might apply in our own present, in a time when people talk about this as being, you know, us being in a postmodern condition, and there's many different viewpoints on exactly what that means, um, but a lot of them, you know, are taking uh, uh, stock of of what Nietzsche is art articulating in in *The Birth of Tragedy* and in his later works. If we were to, you know, think about that and think about how the Socratic has been kind of worn out. Um, and whether we want to continue to identify with it or whether we want to try to bring back in something more Dionysiac and something more Apollonian. The open question for all of us, I think, is how would we, how would we do that? How, what forms would that take place? And I don't actually have an answer to that. I haven't, I haven't really thought that out. But I think that is something that people have been struggling with. And so you see in the early 20th century, a lot of people reading The Birth of Tragedy and saying, yes, we have to have a rebirth of art. We have to have a rebirth of music. We have to have a rebirth of this and that. Um, so I don't actually have my, my own answer to that worked out. But I, but I think that this is a, a very interesting problem that, that he's posing. And, and I would say you know, that those who are doing you know, philosophy as a way of life you know, interesting person along those lines, um, Jules Evans, um, who, who I think many of you may know, um, he wants to, you know, sort of recapture more of the Dionysian element to things. And he, he talks about the need to bring that back in, not to be hyper-rationalistic, you might say, about that. And so this is, this is this, you know, is, is something definitely worth exploring. Now, I've talked for about 15 minutes. I'm going to open things up to questions and uh, take some of those rather than simply just uh, chatter on. Um, I'm taking a sip of coffee too. So Heraclitus Ephesius writes, I agree with a lot of his ideas in the birth of tragedy. Without music, life would be a mistake, I think, with art. Um, yeah, and you know, it's not as if music is only Dionysian, according to um, Nietzsche. The Apollonian has its own brand of music. He talks about it as being kind of like, you know, and when we watch those old uh, uh, 1950s through 1970s movies about like Greeks and Romans, and you see somebody with a lyre, playing and it's very sedate and you hear the little music in the background. That's what Nietzsche th thinks Apollonian music is is like. Um, Dionysiac music would be, you know, the stuff that's like, you know, constantly moving and pulsating and, and bringing us in. He talks about, you know, f the folk music. And I don't mean just like sitting around and, you know, um, you know, uh, wear your your overalls and 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 play uh, on some some conventional I instruments kind of folk music. I mean, like the music that really gets people into things. I mean, you could say that that's part of what makes it Dionysiac. That the the person who's listening gets captivated by the music. So, in many respects, I would say that contemporary metal. Um, and a lot of rock and roll manages to bring together the Dionysiac and the Apollonian in very interesting ways. Um, there was a musical form that Nietzsche actually said was quite Socratic, uh, opera. He thought that opera was about as low as you could possibly go in music. And he wasn't talking about Wagner at, at that time. He was talking about, you know, the kind of light fair people go and, you know, they're, I mean, you don't really have to if you're going to the opera at that time, you're really going to be seen and maybe to listen to some nice music. Uh, you don't have, you're not really paying that close attention to it. Or if you are, it's a nice, simple story that you can easily get into. It's sort of like watching a sitcom with lots of musical accompaniment. I suppose that Nietzsche would probably look at contemporary uh, and you know the the 1900s musical theater 
and say something quite similar, you know, like if he's watching Camelot or something along those lines. I don't know. I don't know if he'd, he'd consider all of that to, to fit under that sort of rubric. But, you know, yeah, you're right. Music is, is very important to, uh, to this. Um, now, Dazain Bellin writes, how do you think wonder fits in or does it? So, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, the post-Socratic, you know, Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy stress that philosophy begins in wonder. Um, and I think there's, there's something to that. I don't think it, it always begins there. I agree with Epictetus that sometimes philosophy begins with, you know, seeing people saying different things about the same ideas or issues and wondering, well, how the hell can all these people not be on the same page, right? And trying to figure out where, where would I actually get the answers that I'm looking for, but wonder. So, you know, the Apollonian involves wonder. It involves that sort of being in rapt attention to the images. Uh, imagine listening to a Homeric epic um, being recited to you and having these ideas about the battles of the gods and human beings or the struggles of Odysseus. Um, there's a kind of wonder involved in that. I think there could be another kind of wonder, or maybe we might use a different word, I don't know, like awe, or even Nietzsche talks about terror involved in the Dionysiac. But I think that there's also something involved in the Socratic, and I think this is why Nietzsche, at least in his early work, is quite willing to say that um, the Socratic is a, a noble response, whereas in his later works, he's going to call it a um, ignoble, a base response. Um, so I think that's uh, quite an interesting idea. Uh, there is a kind of wonder that, that goes on with the Socratic. Um, you know, and, and it's, it might be a wonder at something that's not quite there, the rationality of, of the whole, you know. Maybe it's uh, projecting something outward there in the world that isn't, isn't truly there in the world. This is part of what Nietzsche took Kant himself. This is why Nietzsche thought that Kant, uh, instead of being a rationalist, was actually one of the people sort of undermining the whole Socratic enterprise in, in this, this work and le leading to Schopenhauer. Um, so, yeah, wonder could, could mean a lot of different things. Um, and then, of course, there could be just the, you know, sort of gaping oh, wonder of, you know, watching puppets or something like that, uh, that, that Nietzsche, I don't think, would associate with, with any of these responses, you know, just kind of trivial stuff, right? Um, all right, Heraclitus writes, opera as low today, we'd say it's high art, so to speak. Yeah, that, and I think that kind of points to something quite interesting about our, our culture. Um, Nietzsche is, is engaged in what he later characterized as a genealogical enterprise. And, and a genealogical mode of inquiry tries to sort of peel back the, the layers of, of stuff that we have, you know, ended up sort of in, not overlaying uh, the, the realities that we're, we're digging into, which originally had much less noble or, or um, you know, sort of global um, origins, we could say. They, they originated in how people were actually living out their lives. Um, you know, great example of this, I have a video specifically on this with the, the genealogy is punishment. Nietzsche says punishment, there's a lot of interesting theories about why we punish, and um, none of these are actually correct because punishment itself is a complex thing that, that, that developed over time and responded to certain needs in human society. Um, so, you know, opera becomes for us what the rich people and the cool people and the powerful people get to indulge in. So we can have it like, you know, Batman, Batman's parents get killed, you know, coming back from the opera and it makes perfect sense. Oh, we know these are rich people, you know, um, they, they get to enjoy high art. Um, uh, 
I think there's 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 quite a quite a bit of that stuff. And I think if Nietzsche were around today, he would look at a lot of what people call postmodern in art and say that's just degenerate crap. You know, this this endless irony. Um, uh, and playing around with like you know putting your little brand on something and and you know uh, he'd probably look at the whole kind of hipster culture and and just throw his hands up in despair you know I was reading something today uh, somebody was was writing and they referenced ironic facial hair right and I, I don't even know what the hell that means <laughs> um, you know, you, 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 what, you grow a, a beard or a funny mustache because you're making a statement, but you're not really making a statement. I mean, to have the, to begin with, to have the luxury to be able to do that is is just, you know, bizarre. And that one's life could, you know, that could be like the apex of one's existence um, strikes me as, as really weird. And I think Nietzsche would look at that sort of thing and say, wow, uh, this is this is not a noble response at all in some respect. But within our, our society, I think for many people, I mean, we could change the word noble into something like, you know, meaningful in, in, a, in a genuine sense or substitute the word cool, right? I think for a lot of people, what Nietzsche is talking about is, is noble, it would be something understood as as as, as cool. Um, maybe we have a mistaken viewpoint on what constitute really viable ways of existence that can lend a person person's life real meaning in response to the problem of life. Or maybe um, Nietzsche was too restrictive. In how he thought about it, I, I suppose that would be you know up to others to say. Um, all right, I don't see any other questions or comments in the live chat window, um, so I'll just talk a little bit about uh, what we've got coming up this 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 month ahead of us, and then we'll see if anybody else wants to ask anything or say anything. Can we be about Nietzsche? Can be about anything else you like. I'll I'll read your response and and then uh, say my piece uh, in relation to it. So um, we're kind of winding down. I, I did um, twelve talks in five different locations uh, over the last month and a half. Uh, and this week, you know, this Thanksgiving week is the first week where I, other than online things like this, I don't have any other uh, things that I, I, I have to do. I don't have to show up anywhere to talk about things. So I, I really, you know, I'm playing a bit of catch up. I don't, I've only got a few in-person things here in the Milwaukee area. Um, one is, is uh, in that, that uh, speculative fiction and philosophy series. The other is in the women uh, authors that you should read. And I'll be talking about some interesting stuff there. Uh, but this month, for the online events that we're doing, uh, I'm going back to focus on Epictetus. And I will be talking about um, choice and how he understands choice and character, how it is that we form our characters. So you could say we're going back into the, the Socratic. Um, and that's, uh, you know, how how uh, it, it kind of would fit in from Nietzsche's perspective. Nietzsche was pretty tough on the Stoics. Um, he, he didn't always have a lot of great stuff to say about them. Ah, looks like we've got a, a uh, question right here. What do I think about Nietzsche's political views? Is he a fascist, an anarchist, something else? So that's a, that's a good question. Uh, he's definitely not a fascist. Um, you know, historically, fascism comes on the scene. In the 20th century, Nietzsche dies at the beginning of the 20th century. You might say, well, maybe he's a proto-fascist or something like that. Um, I think if you look at the historical movements and even a lot of the theorists, even though they, they often drew upon Nietzsche, as well as you know other uh, sources as well, um, it's not a great fit to, to say that he would be a fascist. Um, you know, fascism is, is kind of a, a complicated matter anyway. I, you know, when I say fascism too, by the way, I don't mean um, the sort of uh, 
simplistic views on it that you know like, like the marxists have that it's just you know this this uh, uh sort of spin off of capitalism or you know the, the the even like lower thing where anybody you don't like who's an authoritarian is a fascist we want to make a very strong differentiation if we want to, the word to mean anything between um you know military dictatorships that are actually conservative but but not fascist in order to be a fascist you have to focus on mobilizing the masses um you have to you know essentially pivot yourself between left and right in in many ways um you know you can't you certainly you certainly may co-opt the the traditional right and definitely there's there's what's called pelinogenesis right um which means a, a focus on the you know sort of old origins of, of things, but it takes it you know takes all these different characteristics to be fascist, and then you know along the same spectrum there's national socialism and all that, um, and, and Bob is right that fascists some fascists do have a weird fascination with him. Some I think actually uh, you know reject him. Um, and I think a lot of the people who have been really fascinated and focused just on, they focused very selectively on parts of Nietzsche's philosophy. So they might have liked the, you know, the anti-establishment, uh, anti-Christianity part, um, uh, but then they kind of ignored, like a great example, uh, when it comes to like anti-Semitism, Nietzsche, he was in a sense an anti-Semite, but he was the kind of anti-Semite who thought that anti-Semitism was about as low as you could possibly go in intellectual life, right? Um, he, you know, he criticizes Judaism as well as even more so Christianity for how things played out in history. But the the kind of low low class, you know, let's let's round up the Jews sort of thing. Nietzsche would have said, "You guys are just trash," you know. So uh, it, now is Nietzsche an anarchist? Um, Her Heraclitus is asking, wouldn't Nietzsche be a super individualist? Yes and no. I mean, it's hard to say exactly who Nietzsche looks up to. Um, and, you know, there are some examples in, in the people that he lauds of political figures. Um, he certainly, he is an individualist in this sense, right? That he thinks that the way society has developed, if you're taking your cues primarily from society, you're going to be robbing yourself of the opportunity to fully develop. Um, and you're going to be going into some cul-de-sacs or dead ends. Um, and so, you know, anything where we might like take a vote about it to decide whether it's good or bad um he you know it's going to be a problem for for nietzsche it's interesting you know when i gave that talk recently i mentioned that nietzsche would have you know not been for american idol right where we simply vote on who the the good candidates are and then we have these kind of you know uh, placeholder judges who who do their little shtick, you know, and 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 all that, and it's generally, you know, been been sort of pre-selected to to give us musical talent, um, but it's in a very digested form. Um, and somebody got really worked up about it. He's, I don't like you having examples about that sort of thing, and you should you you know shouldn't be bringing that up in terms of Nietzsche. And I mean, if Nietzsche were around in the present. Um, he would be criticizing those sorts of things. You know, you look at what he was criticizing in his works at the time, um, a lot of it was matters of the popular culture of, of his day. So I think that's perfectly legitimate if we want to try to extend his thought into the present. So I'm going to springboard over Dazen Bellin's comment and come back to that because uh, Artitsignus, uh, writes, Nietzsche admired Wagner for what he represented essentially as a signifier, but do you think Nietzsche thought musicians and artists themselves as an occupation qualified as nobility? No, definitely not. I mean, historically, musicians and artists, um, you know, for the most part, have been people who who work for somebody who might actually be, you know, in a one-up position. Um, 
there there have been cases where, and, and it goes all the way back to ancient Greece, where there was some autonomy of the artist, um, you know, in relation to both the product and the patron. But that was not the case for for most artists, and still I would say is not the case today. I mean, if you're a, a musician, you make your money uh, playing weddings. If you're a photographer, you make your your money photographing weddings or doing headshots or stuff like that. And then you get to do your other stuff on the side. And very, very, very few people really enjoy a lot of autonomy, except if they do it on the on the side or if they want to be you know starving artists. Um, and I don't think that Nietzsche would, would consider a person who does that to be automatically noble, right? I mean, they certainly could be that way, um, but it would require having talent, and that's not something you can take for granted among everybody. Um, yeah, and, and, and I, I understand uh, in terms of the explication of noble virtues, or rather not noble virtues, but rather the noble valuation of life. Um, I mean, there could be artists who have that, that Nietzschean perspective on things. Um, many of them probably won't be artists working in artistic media. Many of them will be artists working in the media of business organizations or, you know, language in general or other things. There's, you know, there's no, there's no reason why it would be confined to the arts. But all that said, there's nothing to prevent artists from, from adopting that sort of point of view. Um, I don't know that, that Nietzsche provides more than just kind of an intellectual springboard. He certainly doesn't lay out for the practicing artist or musician uh, a program of, of exactly what they ought to be doing. Um, so, yeah. Now I'm going to skip back very quickly to to Dasein Bellin's um, point because then Bob's uh, thing ties in nicely with that. Two new translations of the Phenomenology of Spirit on Amazon now for pre-order, both very expensive. Well, that's good um, that they're out there. I imagine one of them is is Pinkard's translation, which has been floating around for a while. Uh, that I have a I have a PDF of a, a draft of, which is quite good. Um, in some respects, it's a more faithful translation than than the Miller translation, which is kind of the standard English translation now. At the time, I suppose you know, ten years from now, perhaps um, Pinkard's translation will supplant it, um, but it's not going to do so right away because there's so much already invested in using that that you know now older translation just as there was in using Bailey's uh, earlier translation as well there's so much literature out there that is citing the Miller translation um, it's going to take a while to adjust and and I don't know that you know when it comes down to it I don't I don't think that you have to have um, you know the newest translation you know I suppose it's important for for scholarship, but um, oftentimes, you know, there's no such thing as like the best translation um, uh, in in most cases. Uh, and you know, we can say a sim similar thing about um, Nietzsche as well. That people are always well, which which um, which one do I have to get? You know, which uh, which translation? And I always say, well, I don't know. You know, I mean, if I if I get concerned about how the translation seems to play itself out, I just go to the original anyway. Um, Nietzsche is is somebody who's actually fun to read in in German. Hegel, Hegel's not really that fun to read in German or in English, and he's not all that fun to read in French either in Hippolyte's translation. Um, but but it's worth reading. So let, let's take uh, Nietzsche's. Um, <laughs> Let's take Bob Knight's uh, thing. What do you have to say about the relation between Nietzsche and Hegel? So, um, you know, Nietzsche did not see himself as a Hegelian. It was kind of hard at the time, I think, to avoid contact with the Hegelians. And he, he in his self-criticism, he actually says that his uh, early work, The Birth of Tragedy, is, is a little bit too Hegelian. Um, 
but I, I wouldn't say that there's a hell of a lot of relation between them other than the fact that they're occupying some of the same cultural space, you know. Um, people sometimes try to do compare and contrast, you know, like Hegel's master-slave dialectic versus Nietzsche's discussion of master morality and slave morality. And they don't really map onto each other that well, in part because Hegel's master-slave dialectic is really just one little portion of the entire work, um, which doesn't it doesn't really deserve to be blown up into like the key to Hegel the way that I think a lot of 20th and some 21st century thinkers have, have done, in part because they, they uh, you know, find it convenient, right? Um, that said, you know, I'm, I'm not knocking the master-slave dialectic. It's an interesting thing. But I don't think you get that much mileage out of comparing the two of them against each other if these are supposed to be understood as, like, world historical um, stuff. Uh, so Bob follows up saying, would it be possible to implement parts of Nietzsche's philosophy into Hegel's system of science? I know, of course, Nietzsche was very anti-system. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure why one would want to do that. Um, I mean, and what are we talking about in terms of Hegel's system of science? If we're, if we're talking about, like, the historical development of consciousness laid out in the phenomenology, I, I think that kind of stands on its own, and... Um, you know, I am already somebody who says I, I'm not following Hegel all the way to absolute knowing, and I think there's some big gaps in here, um, but there's some cool stuff along the way. Um, I'm not one of these people who says, well, either you buy the whole Hegelian system or you don't buy any of it, uh, which included Hegel, by the way. He, he kind of thought that way. Um, I think that's, that's a mistake. Um, you know, can you take some of the dynamics that Nietzsche is talking about and some of the dynamics that Hegel is talking about and bring them together? Sure. I mean, that's that's been sort of a a uh, uh, stock and trade of French and German intellectuals in the, the 20th century, you know, whether we're talking about the Frankfurt School or we're talking about, you know, uh, French uh, Nietzsche-inspired, you know, uh, post-structuralist thought. Um, there, there, a lot of them are doing things like that. Um, I guess the question is what you want to take from from both thinkers and, and what mileage you want to get from that. And there's nothing that says that just because Nietzsche was anti-systematic that you can't um, you can't you know systematize what he's doing um, or try to import it into a a larger system. It's not like he has, you know, some sort of absolute prohibition on you ever doing that, right? Um, it's just a question of the, the eclecticism that you're adopting. How well are you able to integrate these components with each other? And that, that's sort of a general question, not just for Nietzsche and Hegel, but I think for philosophy in general, you know. Um, people will say, uh, uh, for for example, for me, right, I, I draw very heavily on the Aristotelian tradition. I draw very heavily on the uh, Platonic tradition, both through Platonists like like Plutarch and also through you know various um, Jewish and Christian Platonists. I draw very heavily on the Stoics. I also draw very heavily on existential thought. How can you possibly you know hold all of these together? They contradict each other on certain points. Yeah, sure. They do, um, so I'm not. I'm not saying that I, I take you know like say Aristotle's system, and then just shove everybody else into uh, that and find a category. It's more of a dynamic process, right? And and I've I've actually one of the things I said because it's kind of a cool realization re recently, in the Stoic forums was, I don't call myself a Stoic, but I probably understand and practice more stoic philosophy than many of the beginners who are really enthused about it and self-identifying as as stoics um you know and, and similarly you know am i an aristotelian am i an existentialist yeah kind of you know i'm willing to to say okay about that and then i'll say but I don't agree with them on this and I don't agree with them on that. And I think that that's really, you know, you see that a lot in, in the history of philosophy. Aristotle himself was doing that, you know, the uh, great Stoics were doing that, bringing together 
things along those lines. Aquinas's model is is something like that. Um, you know, this assimilative and integrative work. Um, it's an ongoing theme. All right. Uh, I think I may have missed another thing that uh, Neo Pelagian was asking. Yeah, earlier. Would Nietzsche have voted for Trump? He asks. And isn't Nietzsche just a practical Hegelian? Well, I mean, Hegel was a practical Hegelian. <laughs> you know, I think Hegel's work. When we read it closely, it's saying, listen, unless ideas actually do become practical, they're not really much as ideas. Um, but I, I'm not sure what it would mean for Nietzsche to be a practical Hegelian. Um, you know, is, does that mean that he's just applying some things that Hegel had already worked out? Uh, maybe. But would Nietzsche have voted for Trump? Definitely not. Um, I mean, it's it's funny because you have these people like saying, uh, yeah, Trump is a, a Nietzschean character. He's kind of a Machiavellian character. I don't think he represents Nietzscheanism a, a, at all. I mean, um, he's kind of a, a goof. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's clear that he doesn't have iron self-control because he can't help from getting in fights with everybody on Twitter. You know, I don't, I don't think there's a great master plan behind him. And he, you know, what, what he's been successful in primarily is in convincing people to give him money and second chances and to, you know, let him have a shot at, at trying things out. Um, now, he did tap into a lot of rage, but I think a lot of the rage that he tapped into is, quite frankly, from a Nietzschean perspective, uh, slave morality resentment. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't see him as, as a particularly Nietzschean figure. I, I see him as the sort of thing where Nietzschean would look at it and be like, see, see how, how screwed up our culture is? <laughs> Not that his opponents were any better. Um, you know, whether we're talking about the, the, the bench of Republican candidates or, you know, what, what the uh, Democrats put forward uh, or even what the third parties were able to put forward. Um, I think Nietzsche would look at most of our political class and say, these are all people who are basically living out one form of slave morality or another. Um, he would not be particularly optimistic about it. And he would hate what the, you know, the media on both sides have been doing as well. All right, Bob asks, have you read uh, Oscar Wilde's Soul of Man Under Socialism uh, has a very Nietzschean edge? I have not read it. Um, I, I, I would like to. Um, that would be kind of interesting. I've gotten... You know, I like I like Wild. I actually just finally read Salome, which we had laying around here for the first time. It was a pretty cool book. Oh, well, not book, play, right? It's a short play. Um, and Wild is, is is an interesting person to to check out. Um, Shaw also was you know playing around with Nietzschean ideas. Um, Chesterton writes against Nietzsche. There's kind of a a great you know sort of back and forth happening in, in British literature with Nietzsche um, in the later part of the 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century, I would say. Um, so, yeah. Um, going back to Neo-Pelagian, resentment, slave morality, reactive applies to Hillary Rodham Clinton more. Eh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say more. I would say, you know, once you've crossed a certain threshold of it, there's probably uh, enough of it that it doesn't matter. It's it's all reactive stuff in one way or, or another. Um, and this is kind of an interesting topic. You know, people, like I remember, you know, reading Nietzsche as a late adolescent, you know, in my teens and uh, trying to live out this this sort of stuff. And realize, you know, looking back on it, realizing that I totally misunderstood what it would mean to be uh, to be Nietzschean. Um, you know, according to Nietzsche's own own uh, ideas about it. Um, but I guess that's kind of par for the course. You could say the same thing about so many other philosophies. All right, Heraclitus writes. I think the main problem with Stoicism is that they underestimate anger which is part of our nature. I think if anger is channeled correctly, it can be a force against fascism. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with, 
parts of that. Um, I don't think that fighting fascism is part, is the most important thing to do with properly channeled anger. Uh, I would, you know, I don't have the sort of that sort of monocentric uh, view on it. I think it's enough to stand up to bullies, perhaps, uh, who probably aren't fascists. Um, uh, or to do, you know, many other things with it. And and I would say that, you know, what you're saying there fits in with what Aristotle and the Platonist tradition say, and this is where they differ from the Stoics. Um, I, you know, I mean, if you think that the main problem with the Stoics is that they underestimate anger, I, I would say read some more and you'll probably find other things where you disagree with them because that strikes me as, you know, a very, very specific criticism to make. I, I think there's lots of other points where people might criticize the Stoics, you know, lack of a faculty psychology, for example, which is what the, you know, not understanding uh, how anger could be useful, I think, fits in with. It's a broader topic. You know, the Platonists and Aristotelians recognize different parts of the soul, one of which is the part we get angry with. Stoics don't. Um, they say, you know, look, it's all either the ruling faculty or the other stuff, but it's all the same, same mind. Um, but, you know, to say that, here's another interesting thing though, too. Um, yes, getting angry, the capacity for that is part of our nature. That said, Platonists, Aristotelians, even, you know, somebody arguing it from a Nietzschean perspective would say the anger that most people feel is off base and misguided and, um, leads them astray and becomes vicious and, and isn't life affirming. Um, even if it does serve useful purposes some of the time, we, we're, we can easily go really off, off the wall with it. And we, we generate habits and, and we often become prisoners of these habits and not just habits, but also narratives and sort of, you might say, relationship dynamics. Um, and this is where something like Nietzsche and Rosanthemont can, can come in. And, and I think Nietzsche, one of the great contributions I think Nietzsche really does make, and that's not happening, by the way, in The Birth of Tragedy, it's happening later on, is his analysis of Rosanthemont um, and how it arises, how it manifests itself. I think he's dead on with that. I also would recommend Mach Shaler's work on it, where he takes Nietzsche's idea and, and, and expands it a bit um, Bob asks, what do I think of Zizek? Um, well, that's a hard question to answer because I'll tell you this. I don't read most of what Zizek writes because I don't have the time. Um, sometimes Zizek says stuff and I, and I, I read it and I'm like, yeah, I think that's pretty dead on, including a lot of the stuff that he writes, you know, sort of on the fly in the contemporary political, uh, realm. Sometimes I read the stuff and I'm like, man, this guy is just playing around with ideas and, you know, sort of like throwing stuff to the wall and seeing what might stick. And there's a lot of people who kind of hero worship him and, and are willing to grant him all sorts of stuff, or they just like him around because he's a very, you know, strange guy and seems to be quite entertaining. And you could definitely count on him to say something uh, crazy every, every so often. So for me, it kind of ranges over, over the gamut. I don't think that 100 years from now, uh, we're going to look back and say that he's an important person to read uh, in order to understand, um, you know, what was happening in terms of great philosophy in the 21st century. Um, but he's interesting. Um, I don't think that he's he's not worth reading. I just don't have the time to actually spend much time on that. Um, there's so many other people out there to to look at, and I know he's you know he can certainly fill a room, right? Um, so there that, that's kind of cool that there's a philosopher who people want to bring in. Um, Dasein Bellin is that the same as resentful? Can you expand? So so. Um, Nietzsche diagnoses what he calls resentiment, and it, you know that's a, a French term that you can translate as its cognate resentment. Um, is there is a dynamic in which the human being um, 
normally wants to retaliate against, you know, injury, insult, disrespect, um, and is unable to do so. And that affect of, of, you know, wanting to retaliate doesn't go away. It gets sort of repressed. It gets pushed down. Um, I mean, Freud is talking about something similar too, right? Uh, and it's going to come out in, in other ways. And eventually, if this happens enough, it becomes part of uh, the personality, something that infects an entire culture or a range of culture. So a lot of what we call passive aggressiveness, Nietzsche would diagnose as resentment. Um, how do people become passive aggressive? You know, um, Nietzsche thinks that it also has to do with a tendency to try to lower things, trying to tear everything down. This um, this desire to like, you know, bring everything down, not just not to raise everybody to the same level, right? But to bring everybody down to the same level. So Nietzsche himself thinks that um, contemporary, you know, uh, uh, attempts to, you know, socialize things or democratize things or to make things equal really represent resentment. Um, and he might be wrong about that, you know. Um, they don't represent a sort of noble nature. See, the noble person can either retaliate because they, they, they have the guts to do so, or they're really able to let things go. Um, the, the lower nature kind of keeps, holds on to all the stuff and becomes sick in the process. And, you know, with time, this can become part of an entire culture. And that's what Nietzsche thinks has been happening in, in the West for a long time. Um, Artitsik Gnutz, um, Right, so it would have been interesting for Nietzsche to talk about mirrors and its contemporary extension, cameras, as a development of the self and the collapse of virtues. Yeah, you know, if, if Nietzsche had been healthier and had lived longer, um, who knows what kind of stuff we would have got out of him. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, he, uh, he really wasn't that healthy, and he went insane. Um, and uh, that really curtailed his his career because he was really an interesting, uh, uh, you know, observer of of culture, and and he he had a lot of depth to what he was sort of thinking out. Uh, Heraclitus Ephesius writes, "What do I think of Albert Camus? Um, I like him quite a bit. Um, one of the things I really like about Camus is, you know." He, he was somebody who, who really tried to think out the, the modern situation. Um, and, uh, I mean, you see this great transition from the early stuff like, you know, The Stranger and, um, you know, The Myth of Syphysis to the more mature work like, you know, The Plague and The Fall and his, his you know, response to The Myth of Syphysis, The Rebel. Um, Camus doesn't have easy solutions for us, but he does put his finger on a, a lot of important pulses, you might say. Um, you know, the, he, he sort of like thinks out, well, what would it be to live in an absurd universe and how can we manage it? And I, you know, people often said like, you know, Camus was the better novelist and Sartre was the better philosopher. I don't really agree with that. I think I, I actually really enjoy Camus philosophical works. I enjoy Sartre as well. Um, and I actually think Sartre is a pretty good novelist too, you know. Um, but yes, Camus is somebody who, uh, uh, you know, you might say he's kind of like a fellow traveler, somebody who uh, you, could, you could imagine having a great conversation with and not necessarily finding yourself in agreement with, which is, which is important uh, in, in philosophy. All right, we're getting close to the end of the hour. Um, why don't we take any final questions or comments? Um, and then we will call it a day. Um, in the meantime, I'll say uh, some, some really excellent uh, uh, questions and, and comments, uh, giving me some, some good things to think about myself. Mm -hmm.
Um, I enjoy, you know, uh, spending time on, on Nietzsche. Oh, okay, Bob's reminding me I missed one of his. Where do I think Hegel would lie in our weird, complex political spectrum? Hegel, like most other philosophers that we study, would find himself disgusted by and unable to find himself a home in our current political spectrum. Here in the United States, our spectrum is basically two, two coalitions, um, both of which are largely um, deluding themselves about what good they're doing and are mostly concerned about taking or keeping power. Um, and that's the Democrats and the Republicans. I think Hegel would um, not in good conscience be able to, to align himself with either of those. Um, I mean, you want somebody who's kind of similar to Hegel in that respect. Look at Alistair McIntyre um, and, and you know, see where he fits in the political spectrum. Uh, Bob writes, I don't, I don't just mean an American liberal politics, but the wider radical political spectrum. I don't know. I don't even know what that means. Um, the wider radical political spectrum. I mean, are you just talking, you're just talking about people on the left who, um, sometimes are aligned with a party or not. Um, most of whom are totally ineffective and disorganized. And, um, I mean, would Hegel have come in and been like, oh, great potential here for me to, to do something with. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, all right. So Bob clarifies by saying uh, like socialist, communist, fascist, traditionalist, anarchists, uh, the crazy shit as well. Yeah. I mean, these are terms that, that mean a million different things. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't see when it comes to actual political organization and getting things done, not many of them in the liberal democracies are doing much of anything, you know. Um, so I, I don't think Hegel would would be jumping into some, you know, some fascist cell or, you know, <laughs> lining himself up with a, if, if you understood traditionalist to mean the dark enlightenment or something like that, I don't think he would be uh, doing that at all. He might be sort of sitting back at a distance and, you know, looking at them with kind of a, uh, cold eye and, and trying to chronicle it, but but they're they're pretty ineffective, uh, except in you know a few places, as far as I can tell, on both the far right and the far left. Um, we're we're kind of stuck in a, a really crappy situation, and here in America, we're stuck in the worst in, in a certain respect, in that it's very difficult to change, because um, what it would require to to change the current party system would require the parties to actually want to change it. And that's not going to happen. There's too much money and power and uh, tradition involved to do that. Uh, there's better prospects in the, you might say, in the younger democracies than there are in this one. Um, well, that would, be, that would be an interesting thing to think about um, from Hegel's perspective. He did think in terms of like, all right, where is where is the real progress going to take place if it does take place? Which which country can it happen in? Um, I don't know. I'd have to really think about that from a Hegelian perspective. Where where can we look right now and see, you know, history marching in some anything that looks like the right direction? Uh, I have a hard time coming up with that. Um, because everywhere I look, I see some something that's problematic. You know, I guess it's just a question of which is less problematic. <laughs> you know? It's definitely not going to be Russia or China or or uh, at this point in time India. Uh, it's it's probably not the EU. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not Britain. Definitely not Brazil. <laughs> it's not the United States. Uh, you know, and Hegel wouldn't like pick some some little tiny place and like say, well, you know, the the Finns have got things right because um, you know it's got to be something that can actually really galvanize the world. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So that's kind of a that's kind of a, a downer to end on, but that's what we're going to do. Um, and, and so you know, to swing it back to Nietzsche, the question I guess for us would be if we get away from the Hegelian perspective, you know.
and we think about it more in terms of Nietzsche, how do we how do we deal with this? How how do we as individuals address um, the the lousy situation that that we've inherited? Um, and so that's that's a good uh, that's a good question for us. All right, I'm going to wish all of you guys uh, a great uh, weekend and uh, stop the, the broadcast. But thank you before I do that again for your questions and comments.